morning. How are you? Good. How about you? Good. Pulled out this morning. <laughs> Can you hear my heater running at all? No. Okay. Sometimes people can and sometimes people can't. So it's always what's going on. Okay, I'm gonna check my other camera real quick. Okay. Do I need a are you hot lead 2.0? Yeah. Can you hear me on this side, Julia? Yeah. Okay. You should be able to share because I think, do I need to give your other Holly co-host too? Yes, please. Okay. Is it just beeping because uh, people are entering? Okay. Yeah, I'm just, well, they're in the waiting room. I'm making them stay there till everybody's ready. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like it's a lot easier that way. Yeah. Okay. We had one last weekend. She must not be comfortable or never used Zoom. And so like, I don't know how she was doing it, but she kept interrupting Marissa somehow. And like even interrupting her um, her presentation too, like it was changing colors. Oh, we weren't sure what was going on. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what else. That should be, uh, should be good to go. This is what they're going to be getting today. Ah, cool. We'll sign up for a form and then they get native seeds okay. for us. So um do you have a link that you're gonna have them send you, or how do you want to do that? I have a Google Doc or a Google Forms that I'll put into the chat, give them time to fill out, and then that way, kind of what I'm figuring is if a majority of them are in Lincoln, then I'll just send them to you. And then they can just pick them up from the office because I, I don't want to be mailing out each one of these if they're all in the Lincoln area. I don't blame you. And if, I mean, if that's even a hindrance on like budget or anything, you could send them to us and we can get them sent out anyways. No matter what, wherever they're at. Yeah, I'll get it figured out. I, I think I can get them mailed out, but I just figured if they're all in the same area, it's a lot easier to send it to one location than. You know, and we've, we've had a few of the people that have, um, they've 
listen afterwards and then they'll contact say hey she mentioned this and so you know, maybe even send us a few more and i'll say well yeah. here's in lincoln shut down some of these things so they don't go on um julie geyser got a hold of me her um tv station did a little thing on this so i sent over some talked with julie she was going to do the actual interview but i sent her over some like b-roll and stuff that they could use to build up the hype for it great maybe i'll give it about one more minute is there any question that you want to add like if we were to do a poll any no, no. Okay. It, so with this, they can't. You said that they can hear or they can jump on and ask a question, or is it all just through chat? It's all video. This uh, this Zoom will be all video, audio, and video. Okay. Um, yeah. It's just Facebook when it's only the chat. Yeah. Well, we have it set up like. Um, our Zoom account that with the different types, we have the one where we can have like up to 25, 30 people and they can each be talking to each other. Or we have the one where we can have a hundred people, but they can't talk. They must do everything through chat. Oh, like a webinar type thing. Yeah. Okay. This one, they sh I think they can get in and participate. So. Okay. If not, I'll, I like I said, since I have the dual screens, it makes watching chat while presenting a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, nope. They, we, last week they were, you know, you'll find that they hide their face normally anyways, which is okay. Usually the connectivity um, is a works a lot better when video is off. If there gets to be any that are like randomly just talking, I may and then just say, hey, let's, you know, let's leave the chat room area just to just ask questions. Mm -hmm. I can be the bad guy. Well, and with co-host ability, I think we can mute them or ask them to mute themselves if that's a problem. I muted a couple was it last week or one other time I muted them because like their chat realized they're being a big distraction. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let them in. Okay. Sounds good. We want to unmute it. I can't hear her. Good morning, everyone. Um, Holly will start with Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever will start presenting here real soon. Uh, if you would please put your mics on mute uh, presentation and there'll be times that, you know, you sure can unmute and ask a question or you can always use the chat box and um, ask questions throughout the presentation. So we will start here in about a minute.
All right, it looks like we might have a few more still trickling in here, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope you all um, are having a warm morning. It's very cold outside, so I prepped um, some of the things I was planning to do outside, switched them indoors. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. This is planting a pollinator garden. This is a partnership um, between the Nebraska Becoming an Outdoor Woman and Pheasants Forever and Quill Forever of Nebraska. A little bit about myself. Um, my name is Holly Moslin. You might, some of you might know me as Holly Green. I recently got married. I've worked with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission for about six years before I joined with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever of Nebraska. A lot of things that people misunderstand about Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever is that we're not just focused on hunting upland bird species. While that is a large part of our mission, we do much more than that. We frequently work with landowners to put habitat on the ground, whether that be for increasing their soil health or helping with erosion control um, to just putting in more habitat for wildlife in general, benefiting songbirds and game birds alike. Um, that's part of our mission, a huge part of it. And you'll notice if you look really closely at our logos that it says pheasants forever and quail forever, but it also says the habitat organization as habitat is our main focus when we work with anything um, in our programs or through our mission. We understand that if you want those deer, turkey, pheasant, even the pollinators, you have to work with habitat first. Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever have a large part in the, the pollinators program. So we have a program called Milkweed in the Classroom where um, third to fifth graders raise milkweed and then later assist a Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever chapter with uh, planting a pollinator plot in their local community. We also do habitat meetings. So we do annual state habitat meetings. This year will be our 30th and it's been moved outside. So mark your calendars for June 26th. It will be held at the Heartland Shooting Range near Grand Island. Um, and we'll be doing a variety of hands-on activities talking about habitat and how you can help pollinators. The last pollinator event that I'm gonna discuss in this portion um, is our Miles for Monarch Challenge. I'll be posting a link here in the chat. Um, this is a challenge that we're doing with the Monarch Joint Venture that is focusing on helping the monarch populations. This year was one of the lowest recorded in history for the Western monarchs. Um, less than 2,000 of them survived. And so we have partnered with the Monarch Joint Venture and we encourage everybody to try and make 3,000 miles um, worth of movement. You can hike, bike, paddle, so kayakers and canoers can even get involved in this challenge. Um, and a portion of the money goes to the Monarch Joint Venture for putting habitat on the ground, but a portion also stays local with the Nebraska Pheasants Forever where we do education for pollinators as well as, again, getting habitat on the ground. Um, bear with me as I try and get my link to work here. Okay, well, it doesn't want to work right now. Let me see if I can do this. And I will go back through um, and post these later on. So, oops. A little bit more, uh, I have been working on native gardening here in my home uh, for the past three to four years. Uh, native is a big part of what I choose to do, partly because I do not have a green thumb and cultivated plants require much more attention. Um, so I've chose to go the native route. I am a very, very busy person. Um, I'm the outreach and communication coordinator for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever here in the state. And so I don't have time to really focus on a cultivated garden where you're spending multiple hours a week. Native gardens, as we'll learn, um, are much easier to take care of. The reason why we do a big push for native is because native plants belong here in this region. Um, so native are plants that naturally occur in the area. They're also highly needed. If you care about pollinators in any fashion, whether it be um, getting honey from a European honey, Bee or the bumblebees or the monarchs, 
um, native plants are needed as they've adapted and grown together and evolved together. And so it's a big push for being pollinator driven. So here you can see my, my lovely dog in one of the pollinator plots that I established a few years ago. Um, and you have two spots here that I decided to work on um, and it did phenomenally. I purchased a Pheasants Forever pollinator honey bear. It's a recycled honey bear that has full of seed enough for 2000, um, or not 2,200 square feet. And I sewed that into these sections here. And as you can see in the pictures, we had some lovely plants start coming in and filling through. So today we're gonna to be focusing on how to build a pollinator plot in your, um, in your backyard specifically, but Pheasants Forever does have um, alternatives for those of you who have larger scale programs, say you have your own um, land farming, we have cost incentive programs to help you put that pollinator pro uh, project on the ground. So here you can see my lovely little home. Um, this one I just purchased in August. And so you can tell that we had a master gardener who previously owned the property, but I'm looking to switch it to native ground. So the first thing you want to start looking at when you're looking at a property, let me get this clear. There we go. So when you start looking at your property, one of the first things you want to look at is where is your sunlight going to be? This is kind of a, a photo of or a design of my backyard. And so this portion, we face, uh, the house faces north to south and we have a larger house off to our east. Because of that, we get shade as the sun begins to pass to the west. But most of the time it's receiving a lot of sunlight, which is great for not native plants. Um, they're used to having a lot of sun. They've adapted to having a lot of sun and not a lot of water. Um, thank you for pointing that out in chat, Julia. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, this is this will kind of be progressing, but I'm more than happy to stop and answer any questions at any time. So, like I said, as the day progresses, this area becomes to get shaded. That's not necessarily a no cell point for a pollinator plot. It can be beneficial. Um, it also needs less uh, maintenance in that portion, but that's something you wanna look at. If it's receiving shade almost all of the day, a native pollinator plot will not do well in that location as it needs a lot more sun. Going into the next part that you wanna look at is what's going to impact your soil quality. So in the back of my property, I have some cedars that um, are on the property. Now with cedars, they do a lot of damage to the soil. They are highly volatile. So that means they're, um, they burn really, really hot. Their soil, uh, their um, sap can be um, volatile in that manner. And they also kill the soil around it. So that entire third of my backyard doesn't grow grass, it's not growing any other plants aside from the seeding cedar droppings that are in that location. So trying to put a pollinator plot there will not work. Um, the soil is too toxic to get anything to grow there. So you'll wanna think about that as you're going through. There's different types of soils, especially here in Nebraska. You have your sandier soils out to the west, your loamy soils, which are your mixes between that, that really nice dark um, black to brown dirt with some sand in it. And then you have your clay soils. Um, depending on where you're at, you'll want to consider the plants that are growing there. Different varieties will grow in those different areas. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through. 
So again, if you have um, cedars on your property, you're gonna have toxic soils. They're not going to be able to grow there. A good indicator if you are looking for good soil content is if you haven't been able to get your grass to grow there, then more than likely you're not going to be able to get any of the native plants to take over in that area as well. Something's in that area that's not allowing um, healthy plants to thrive. So that's an area that I've kicked out of my personal property and selected that. So we have the half shaded yard. We have a big portion of the yard that receives sunlight all throughout the day and has good soil content. And then we have the third of the yard that is not going to do well for planting at all due to the cedars. So the area that I've selected for my pollinator plot um, is the, the spot that receives half shade. I like that area, it's big and open um, and would allow for a great portion to do this. Now, if you're looking to do something like this in your house um, at your location, a great way to start is the Google Maps function. The great way to map out where your yard's at, what kind of square footage you're looking at um, and help kind of build that idea there. That's why I encouraged it um, if you were following along in our Facebook um, event page. So again, the selection that I chose was the, the portion right up against my house. They'd receive a, light, a lot of good sunlight. It's away from toxic soils, and that's a very good portion of the yard that has nice loamy soils that'll be able to help those plants thrive and, and continue growing. Any questions at this point for selecting a location? So Josh posted in, after removing cedars, how long does it take the soil to recover? Um, juniper bushes, do they have the same negative effect? So cedars um, or junipers in general um, can take quite a while after the um, soil has, if you've removed the tree and you're waiting for the soil to thrive, there's different things you can do to help it. Um, but it could take potentially several years before that soil will be able to recover. Um, juniper bushes, I'm not quite sure. I'm assuming they're in the same family um, and could have the same effect. Um, I'd have to double check and get back to you on that, Josh. Um, but yeah, after, after removing the cedars, it can take quite a bit of time to reestablish enough um, healthy soils in order to plant there. Um, so hopefully that answered your question there. Not seeing any more. Oh, Julia's posting, um, Holly spot on, we remove a lot of cedars from the pasture and it took three years to recover the soil. Yep, cedars are very, very toxic to the soil. Um, they can have benefits for, for wildlife, um, but in a lot of cases, we encourage people with um, soil health conditions, or even if you're a cattle farmer, um, you'll actually increase yield by getting rid of, of cedars in your, on your property. And you know, you're welcome to contact one of our biologists to, to learn more about that. Seeing no more questions, we're going to move on to selecting a stock. Um, so this is a pretty important piece here um, as we um, decide on a pollinator plot. So you have the option of planting plugs, um, which are pre-started plants, or you have the option of looking at seeds. And so today we're going to be discussing more on the seed portion, um, but know that the plug opportunities are available for you. Um, going on here. So the pros and cons of both. Seeds, um, Nebraska Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever will be providing seed packets for everyone attending today. So this is a nice quantity of uh, native growing pollinator plants and grasses. And so these kits will be available for you at the end. I'll have you fill out a form so that way we can um, get that going for you. Um, Fair, seed is fairly inexpensive in these small backyard quantities. If you're looking for a larger portion, say on a corner irrigation that's not yielding enough, um, it can get to be a little more expensive. And again, Pheasants Forever does provide cost incentive programs for, um, for 
larger scale projects like that. Seed also gets you a wider variety of species when you're looking at planting a pollinator plot. Though it can get hard to get creative with your planting and structure needs. When you're planting the seeds, unless you're picking out every individual one, uh, you're looking at just having to toss them out and letting them grow. You won't be able to select what areas you might have different uh, species of plants. Seeds typically need to be planted in the early spring or the late fall, which also limits um, some of your planting abilities with that. As for plugs, it is a more expensive route, um, but they can be planted much later in the year. Early summer is what you're typically looking at for a plug plant. It also allows for more selective options. You can be pickier with what you want to grow. Um, and it allows for that creative structure. If you wanted to have a line of butterfly milkweed followed by some vervain um, a little further down, you can be more selective and more creative in the designing of that structure. Catherine, what specifically is toxic about those cedars? Um, so it's a competitive advantage um, that the cedars have created and other plants do this as well. Essentially what they do is they send out a chemical into the soil that makes it more competitive for them to grow, but makes it so that other plants can't outcompete them and grow above them. Um, I don't know specifically what that chemical is, um, but that's essentially their evolutionary um, process that's allowed them to be more successful um, as they take over an area. Seeing no other questions, we'll kind of move on. So we have the seeds and the plugs. What you wanna look for in your seed or plug selection is different timed bloomers. So what I mean by that is you're going to have early bloomers, heavy period bloomers, and then late season bloomers as well. So here we have a few examples of some early bloomers. These are typically going to be blooming April to June. And these are very good for early emerging or early migrating insect species. And so um, we have a couple of flowers here, two from the prairie, two from more of the forested area. So you have the past flower. A lot of people call these Easter flowers as well, as they're typically blooming right around that Easter period. Um, so they're quite beautiful, purple, very fuzzy. They're a very small growing plant. Um, and another one from the forest area is the Dutchman's breeches located in the bottom right featured here. Um, they are heart shaped you know, kind of for the holiday season, um, but they're also a very neat species to have around in the forest area. More of the prairie species for early bloomers, you're looking at spiderwort. An easy way to identify the spiderwort is the three petals but it also have two um, grass-like leaves springing off, um, two to three leaves springing off in different directions. Um, quite beautiful. They can range from this deep purple to more of a blue. And then you have the foxglove penstemon. There are several species of penstemon um, here in Nebraska, but the foxglove is one of those earlier bloomers. And I'll provide some more resources um, here later on for you to find what species might look best in the different types of um, blooming periods. During the heavy season, most of Nebraska's native blooming species are blooming from late June, early July is the majority of the, the blooms that we'll see here in Nebraska. So the heavy season is typically from June to August and diversity is key at this point. At this point, many pollinators are awake, active, thriving, um, and not only the pollinators are thriving off of this, but songbirds, game birds, and a variety of other um, mammals are, are needing the, the things that these bloomers are providing. And so the more diversity you have, the more diversity of the wildlife that you'll have coming to your, your areas. Um, much of your plot should be in bloom by this period. Um, like I said, most na native plants will be fully thriving at this point. So a few species that we have here, the top left photo that's featured was actually taken um, this June by one of our biologists, Addie Pernicki in the North Platte area. 
This is on one of our larger scale projects um, with a landowner. It's a Corners for Wildlife project. So in it, we have black-eyed Susans. Those are the ones at the top left of the photo. You have Mexican hat, the um, sunflowers with the red centers, and they can change in their color. They can be red and yellow, white and yellow, or white and red. And then the yarrow, um, which is white clusters. Let's see if I can draw this. Oops. So your yarrow is located right here. And then you have uh, yellow clover, white clover, um, which is this species here. Native plants need any fertilizers? Typically they will not because they're already growing um, in soils that are friendly to them. You shouldn't have to be putting anything extra on them. Um, and it's typically better if you're looking at a fully native plant to not use any chemicals period because it'll benefit the pollinators that are visiting them more often. Um, typically, if you're putting down chemicals, it'll have more of an effect on the animals visiting. Um, but if you select the right soils, like we're discussing here today, and the, the, the locations that will best benefit them, you shouldn't have to do anything for a native pollinator plot. Yes, Lori, this is being recorded and will be posted later on, um, either today or later this week. Um, Julie will put that on the um, Becoming an Outdoor Woman page. Moving on to our late season bloomers. Oh, I guess I should talk about the other plants that I have photoed here. Um, common milkweed, this is our most common species of milkweed here in the state, but we do have several other varieties that are available. Um, you'll have milkweed plants that are harder to grow in your backyards. Um, swamp milkweed, obvious to its name, um, needs a little more water because it's more adapted to growing along um, higher water quantity areas, um, but you do have options to, to grow with your milkweed throughout. Um, if you do have milkweed seeds, um, they are encouraged to go through a freeze period before you plant them. So allow them to sit outside and be cold um, before planting them. Typically, um, you can also try and start milkweed plants in your home during the cold period. Um, that will help establish them in gardens a little bit better as well. You have bergamot on the lower left corner. Um, this one is very common for bumblebees to love uh, a lot as they're adapted to that species. Um, they typically will buzz and vibrate the flower in order to collect the pollen off of it. And then we have many species of vervain, which is the photo on the bottom right. Um, and so that's a nice purple species that comes up throughout the year. Moving on to our late season bloomers. And I did not realize this until today that I have a lot of yellow selections here. There are more colors that, that do come in the late season period. Um, these are just some of the few that I've selected for this presentation. Your late season bloomers are your July to your October. Um, Nebraska's state flower goldenrod pictured on the upper left is one of these plants that prefers to bloom in the late season. And these are very, very much needed for exiting migrating species. So especially the monarch butterfly. If you do not have late season bloomers, the monarch's migration gets more difficult to participate in as they don't have the energy sources to move on. Um, another thing is these species are great for getting ready to hibernate. So there are species of bees that will um, have their larvae in the stems of these species, and they need to have the plant go dormant in order for their larvae to survive the winter. And so having these late season species is great for the, the bees and for the butterflies that are migrating. So again, some of the species that are, are late season bloomers are your goldenrod pictured on the upper left, your Illinois bundle weed pictured on the right. And this one has a, a nice seed pod that develops. Um, it's actually a bunch and you can hear it rattle. And then you have trefoil on the bottom left. 
and wild begonia on the right. Your wild begonia is gonna prefer more of those sandy soils that are available. Laura, are there any resources for native plants that do well in part to full shade? Yes, the resources are the next slide on my page. So you're doing perfectly and keeping up here. So here are some of the resources for choosing your plugs, your seeds, deciding what species of plants that are available. Um, first and foremost, ask a Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever biologist. Um, so that link there, um, you can choose a biologist that's closest to you. They will have um, lists available that they can show you what species will do best in your types of soils um, and help you choose the best options for having the most success. Another resource that Pheasants Forever has is our YouTube channel. And so we have a video that's quite popular, 10 Best Pollinating Plants. Um, and so that is the link provided there, but there are additional habitat tips. There's an entire series um, including like hand harvesting native seeds if you're out and want to collect your own um, and plan a year in advance. That's another option. And then milkweed tips as well. So there's an entire series available for you um, on that portion. And then one of our favorite books that our biologists like to use is this one here, Field Guide to Water, Wildflowers of Nebraska in the Great Plains by John Farrar. It's very, very nice because it's color coded. So if you see a, a plant that you like, you're gonna go to the color and it's going to give you a picture of the species, a description of when it blooms, what soils it prefers, and some other facts about the species as well. And then another great resource, of course, is our UNL extension links. Um, there's one link there um, of how to get pollinator hat um, pollinator habitat certification, the plants that they require in your mix in order to receive the award. Catching up on chat here. Kim, do you have suggestions for native plants that attract butterflies? Um, so pretty much anything flowering will attract butterflies as they need the nectar in order to survive. Um, it depends on what type of butterfly or moth you're also trying to attract. Again, um, many of these plants and these insects have evolved together. And so it's very important to understand the species that you're looking at. And then you know the, the plants that they have evolved with. Um, and I can give you more specific examples if I know which species of butterflies you're trying to attract the best. But again, most generally, as long as you have nectaring plants available, blooming plants, um, you'll be attracting all sorts of butterflies, bees, um, and other animals that require the nectars, including hummingbirds that come through. Thank you for posting the link to that, Julia. Seeing no more questions, we'll move on. So the next portion is planning when to plant. We've talked about selecting an area to plant, um, the pros and cons of the plug versus the seed and what types of plants we need to be selecting for our pollinator plants. So the next one is planning when to do it. So time of the year is going to be what we're going to discuss next. Have some photos that our biologists have taken out in the field. Time of year, you have two options. You have spring and fall. Again, if you're choosing to do plugs, they're typically going to do better in the early summer. In the spring format, which is going to be the main goal we're talking about today, um, it's usually one of the uh, quickest formats with the quickest results. You can actually see them popping up to grow and see the process that they go through. Um, however, they need to be planted between the last snow, the last freeze, and when, um, when you're actually going to be see growth taking place. However, this could be disastrous if you plant too early. And this is always very complicated in Nebraska, as many of you are aware, we could have snow all the way into May um, and receive freezes. Typically when you're gardening, uh, you'll have recommendations on the backs of the seed plants on how early of a freeze you need or how early you need to plant before a freeze. Um, with native seeds, many of them actually require a freeze. 
So be watching, um, but typically this is going to be taking place in March. So you'll wanna be planning for that March period and watching how um, the freezes are taking place. So you'll wanna gauge year by year, um, but typically look for your last freeze in March. Usually with this option of planting in the spring, you'll typically have more maintenance, more weeding to do on the pollinator plot as you have not discovered the seed bank that's already there. Um, and so you'll typically have more maintenance if you do the spring format. If you choose to do the fall, which is one of our recommendations for our large scale plots, um, is you wanna be planting between August and November. And it's the best option because like I said, many of our native plants actually need to be winter treated or they need the, the freeze in order to go through their germination process. Um, this is also great if you choose to plant in the fall because if you want to chemically treat the area, you can do this as the, the weeds that you're choosing to get rid of are going dormant, they're pulling back into themselves. And so if you treat the area, they'll actually be pulling those chemicals down into their system for a more an effective kill on that weeding source. Now, if you choose to do this, you do not always have to worry about the chemical killing your new seeds, as many of these chemicals have a very short half-life, meaning active life. Um, and so it won't harm the seeds that you're going to be putting down after you've done a chemical treat. Um, just read the instructions and follow the instructions from there. Um, and that way you'll understand how long you need to let it wait before you're in a water source or before you choose to put down more seeds. Any questions on this portion on choosing a time of year to plant? Go ahead and move on then. Site prep uh, is the next thing we'll be covering as it's very different from, the, from deciding to plant a garden. Now, this is when I was typically planning to go outside and showcase how I've decided to site prep my area. Um, I wish it looked like the photo that I had up um, and nice and warm, but instead we have negative temperatures today. So I am going to be switching to my camera out in my kitchen where I have a little area set up um, for that. So I will not be able to see chat. So Julie, you might be, have to help me during this section, but I'll be right back as I switch. Sure thing, I will be here all later. Watch for questions. Okay, should probably stop my screen share. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Yes, we can. And can you see the, the plots that I have in front? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So these are two examples of what I want to discuss while site prepping. So on one side, we have an area that you already have vegetation that was growing. And then another site, you have what we call good soil, seed to soil contact. So this is what we want when we're site prepping an area. This is because when we have seeds, in order for them to understand that they need to start growing, they're going to need a water source and they're going to need to be able to feel what's around them. Now, I have some sunflower seeds here that I stole from my husband. He doesn't know I have these today. <laughs> um, and they're much, much larger than what you're typically going to be seeing in a native seed. And I chose these today so I can show you the seed to soil contact. So if I were to take some of these seeds here and try and disperse them around the pot, you see that they bounce off of the vegetation or end up laying on the vegetation here. 
That is what we call not good to see to soil contact. Those seeds are stuck on the vegetation. They're not waking their way down to the soil. So they're not understanding that they're going to need to grow. Additionally, this pot is dormant right now, meaning the, the vegetation is not going to be awake or competing. But as soon as it starts getting warm enough, those plants could start waking up and out competing these seeds that we just put down. Now, if you're a little seed and you're just now getting to that, that soil contact and getting that water, you have a lot of growth to do before you'll be out competing any of these other vegetative plants that are growing. And so placing them on something like this means you'll have less success because they'll be competing with other plants or they may not realize that they need to be germinating in the first place. Now, if I go over here to this plot, where I have the soil available for them to grow. And if I were to plant them, they're automatically getting next to that soil exactly where they need to be. And as you start watering, they're going to start germinating and understanding that they need to be growing in that case. Now to showcase the sunflower seeds were much bigger. These are some native seeds in one of our pollinator honey bears from the Rusky Gima Parks, or not Gima Parks, Pheasants Prep. Uh, lady, Holly, can you pull your hand just a little closer to your camera? There you go. So Thanks. there's the native seeds. I'll bring my fork in here instead of my large finger. So you can see how tiny some of these seeds are. So as a native plant, it's very hard to compete with vegetation that's already there and already growing. So you have a milkweed seed there. And this does have grass mixes in it as well. If you'd like to include those in your pollinator plot, that's actually very helpful as many bees will need grass to grow on uh, or to, to land on and to explore as well as to get ready to hibernate. So you can see those seeds are very, very small. And if I were to try and throw them in there, they're going to be even harder to get that seed to soil contact than those sunflower seeds. Whereas in the area that has the seed to soil contact, they're falling directly on that, okay? So when you're choosing your, your area, you really wanna clear that area out, take out any rocks, clear out all the vegetation um, to make sure that you have that seed to soil contact. Are there any questions at this point, Julia? Uh, we do have a question about best chemicals to kill unwanted plants. Um, it's entirely up to you. A lot of cases um, and one of the most common is going to be your Roundup. Um, it's a very, very effective kill. It, um, not only attacks the root system, but also chemically burns the vegetation that's out on top. Um, but you can go to any of your local hardware stores and discuss it with them. If you're looking at a larger project, um, so larger scale, meaning um, corners or uh, irrigation corners or things like that, you'll wanna discuss um, best killing methods with your USDA office or one of our Pheasants Forever biologists. That way you're getting the most cost effective chemical kill as well. Any other questions? Okay, so the next thing that you're going to want to do with your, your site once you've cleaned out all of the vegetation on top is next you'll want to work with Move this up here so everybody can see. You'll actually want to break up that soil. If it's hard and compounded like this, it's going to be hard for that um, seed to get its root dug in. So what you'll want to do is pretend this is your backyard and this is a rake and not my kitchen fork. You'll want to disturb the topsoil by raking it around. And you don't have to do it very deep. Many, many gardeners are going to be going um, four inches to six inches deep to, to turn over that soil, but you really don't need to do that. The more, the more disturbing you do on your topsoil, the more seeds you might be activating that were already in the soil. So if you just do a light raking on the top of your soil, that's actually 
best for these native pollinator plants. So you just go through the area and lightly rake the top so that you have loose soil available. You can move it around, but it's nice and loose so that if your seed goes in there, it can start working its way deeper down into the soil without having to compete with a hard block of soil. Most people then want to cover their seeds up and hide them. That's actually very bad for a, a pollinator plant. So if we look at our native seed again and how small it is, if I were to take some of these seeds, you can see those small, small black ones there in my palm. That's some of our native seeds. And if you put soil on top of them, they can't get the sunlight that they need to start germinating. And oftentimes that soil will be too heavy for them to start breaking through. So with native seed, you actually just wanna sprinkle it on top and leave it as is with, in order to have the best success. Okay. How soon can you plant after using Roundup? I do not know off of the top of my head, but Roundup is one of those chemicals that has a short half-life, meaning a short active period. Um, so off the top of my head, um, if you're applying according to the instructions, which I highly recommend, um, I would say you could potentially plant um, three to five days after applying the Roundup. But again, check the instructions on the back of the chemical before you make those decisions. It's a, yeah, it's a contact chemical, so pretty short lived as far as I think you could get in there pretty quick, but yeah, read their instructions yes. and it depends on um, moisture and did it wash it through the ground and all that. Yes, yep. So it all depends on the environment, um, when you applied it, if there was a water source after it. Um, and again, they have to disclose all of this information on the chemical label. Um, so if you don't find it there, you can go onto the websites and they have to disclose it there on their websites. So that'll help you in choosing which chemical is applied. There are more um, nature-friendly, pollinator-friendly options, and you can look into those. Generally, they're going to be more expensive, though, because they, they do, they're made to be more nature-friendly, um, and so they're harder to find. But there are nature-friendly options out there. Um, but if you're, if you're really struggling with weeds, then look at more of those higher brand names to, to assist you with that problem. Any other questions? No, I'm not seeing any. Um, just make an announcement. We've had a few coming in here late. Uh, we will post the recording of this presentation on our Nebraska BOW page. And I'll put that link in the chat. Okay. So we've covered some of seeding principles on our, our, our selection. Um, since I did not purchase any plugs for this, I have created my little plug root system. If you choose to plant plugs, um, what you'll want to do is you'll want to wait till early summer. And in that case, you are going to need to disturb the soil further down where you're going to be digging a hole to put that plug in, similar to how you would plant your native pollinated plants. One tip I will give to you if you choose to use plugs is you need to disturb the roots. So they're gonna come in their black boxes in, um, in most cases. And what you'll wanna do is you'll wanna pull that plug out and grab as close to the root system as you can that way you're not ripping up your plug top. Um, so grab down by the base where the roots begin. And then what you'll wanna do is you'll wanna take the dirt down here where all of the white roots are at, and you'll wanna break up that dirt. What that does is that's going to signal to the plant that they can continue growing beyond uh, their typical boundary. So you disturb these, and then you'll plant your plug into that hole, gently cover the top, and a tip that helps trap the water near the plant is if you make a little ravine, if you push down the dirt um, so that it forms a cup next to the base of the plant, that'll help make sure that that water stays there. Oftentimes your plugs will need more water 
um, than just your seed bank that's used to having a low water source. Your plugs will need that extra maintenance, especially because they're being planted during Nebraska's prime heat time. Um, so that's the difference that you'd have if you decide to plant plugs later on in the summer. And I will share some links here later on um, of different nurseries um, here in Nebraska that provide native plugs and native seeding if you choose to do that. Um, at this time, I'm going to step outside um, to showcase the typical seeding that we method that we would do. And again, I'm gonna steal these sunflower seeds to show you um, on the snow. So pardon the camera moving around a lot here, but we're gonna move outside so I can showcase some of this. Holly, while you're traveling outside, uh, does it matter if, if you plant in a pot or in the ground? I think meaning just as a starter. Um, so you can do seed starting while um, in your house. Um, you'll just want to make sure, um, I'll set the camera down here. If you decide to start your own plugs in the house, meaning you're going to be starting them from seed, you can start them in a pot. Um, however, if you're doing that, remember that that Nebraska seed is very, very small. Um, so you typically would want maybe three to four of those seeds in if you're purchasing your own plug site. Um, be careful of how much you put in the same area. Um, so for those small ones, you might be able to get away with three to four of those small seeds in the same area. Um, but if you're, if you're putting a lot of seed in the same spot, it's going to be difficult to transplant um, once the summer comes or they'll outcompete each other, reducing your success. So I plant um, the native grasses and seeds um, for wildflowers in a pot to take to um, expo events with me. So it is possible to do, um, but they grow very, very close together and they need a lot more water because if they're planted in a pot uh, or a, a planter pot, then um, they're dependent on you for that water source. So just remember it's a little more maintenance in that case. Hopefully that answered the question. Welcome to the beautiful Nebraska weather. Holy smokes, you should have a long sleeve shirt on at least, Holly. <laughs> I'm just gonna be out here for a few minutes. Okay. Okay, so just showcase some of the snow here. So when you decide to plant your seeds, typically what you're gonna be doing is you're not going to be sitting here individually placing seeds apart from each other. What you're going to do with a Nebraska native plant um, is you're going to take a handful of seeds in your hand and you're going to do what's called broadcast seeding, meaning you're just going to toss them out there and let them fall as they may. Okay, And you'll do this a couple of different times. Just give a nice swing with your arm and you can see how they start to spread out. Can you see that or do I need to get closer? Um, I we can see, I can see the distribution, the idea of it. Yeah. So again, broadcast seed, you start with your closed fists and flick your wrist. And this is called broadcast seeding. My squirrels will be eating well this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So this is broadcast seeding. This is one benefit of having snow to showcase because when you're doing broadcast seeding on direct soil, um, it's a lot harder to see, but the snow allows it better to see here. And it's also great because it also um, mix up the diversity. Your lighter seeds um, will float down, whereas your heavier seeds will automatically um, hit the ground wherever your toss is at. Any questions on broadcast seeding here? You can also use a thrower if you have a larger area. Um, one of the benefits here in Nebraska, if you have a very large scale project, is we have no-till drills available for rental from many of our Nebraska chapters. 
Um, and so you can get in contact with one of them and actually have a drill do all of the work for you. Um, many cases, a lot of our chapters partner with school systems deciding to um, partner again that milkweed in the classroom project during our expos with Julia and the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, and many times we are there planting pollinator plots at the park. And this is what we do is we give people buckets and allow them to broadcast seed while they are out. Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna head back inside. Holly, we have a question as you're going back inside because you're making me look cold or like making it look really cold out there. Um, is daily watering okay? Like using your, your water or your lawn sprinklers, you know, if you were to use your lawn sprinklers on top of the seed that you just broadcasted out there? It depends on the species that you have selected. Um, so most native plants um, are actually not going to want that much water. They're used to the, the typical rains located here in Nebraska. Um, if you choose to water more frequently, I'd set your sprinkler system up to avoid the pollinator plot um, or select a more, um, a more diverse seeding where they're going to want that water source. So choose more of your um, plants that would grow around our wetland systems um, where they're used to having a lot of water and then not a lot of water. Um, so if you choose to do that with your system, um, there are plants that would be okay with that. But more than likely, you would want to just choose a seed selection or a plug selection where they're going to like that water. Otherwise, you risk overwatering your, your plant system and damaging them. Um, that is another thing to consider if, when selecting your spot. If you are going to have a sprinkler system running, a lot of these plants are actually pretty fragile. Um, and so if your sprinkler system is spraying directly into your plant system, you could actually break them or damage them in that case. Okay, I'm gonna go back into my office here. So I'm gonna mute this camera and turn it off and switch, give me just a moment. Okay, yes, and, and like Julia mentioned in the chat, um, native seeds are so small. So instead of if you use a planter with one strong stream, it actually might move around your seeds or overwhelm the seeds, use something that's more of a stream effect. Go back to sharing my screen here. Um, oops, wrong one. I know we're right at that hour, so it's a good thing we're almost done here. So seeding reminders, if you choose to broadcast your seed, um, disturb the topsoil, loosen it up, um, broadcast seed, toss them out, and do not cover them. That will help with your seeding success. If you choose to do a planting, disturb the bottom root system, um, but you'll want to give them more space. Don't pull, plant them as close to each other because they're really going to need to branch out. Um, and then wait to plant warm, typically early summer. Um, so June would probably be the best time. We've had a few questions about maintenance already. Um, and uh, nice thing about pollinator plots is they don't need a lot of attention. Um, they're, they're adapted to lots of sun and not a lot of rain. Um, and for end of season care, there's a few things you can do. You can hand harvest and reuse the seeds your next season, or you can just cut the stalks off about four inches up from the ground and leave it as soil cover. Um, and this does multiple things. It keeps your seed source local and in your pollinator plot. Um, it protects the bases of your plants that might sprout up again if they're um, one of those annual plants. And it's also going to help pollinators and other, uh, other creatures. 
So there are, um, there's a saying called leave the leaves. And what it is, is it helps bees, it helps moths, it helps caterpillars that actually overwinter in that larva stage. It's very important for those pollinators to have that uh, leaf litter and that stock carrot there as well. And I've mentioned that some bees actually have their larva in the stalks of the grasses and the native plants. And so if you cut that off and throw it in a bag and take it away, you've actually potentially just killed that pollinator source there. Last few things is you can spice up your pollinator garden. You can add in a water source. Um, so if you'd like to attract your birds to your areas, um, but pollinators also need that water source. Um, so if you're deciding to attract your pollinators, put some rocks inside or sand so that those pollinators don't get caught in the water and drown. They're able to pull themselves out in that case. Um, you will want to change your water out regularly um, as harmful bacteria and diseases um, can spread through water. So if you just um, dip, pour it out and then place everything back in, um, changing it out at least once a week would be highly recommended. And then you can add in other things like hideaways, butterfly and moth houses, um, like the yellow one in the center could be placed into your area. Um, you'll wanna change the interior frequently, usually with a fake moss or leaf litter. Um, and then you have bee hotels um, supplied. Um, you can use them from the local garden, like you said, uh, the stalks of the grass or things like that. Or you can get as creative as the bottom left one of a giant um, four by four board. Um, anything aesthetically ple uh, pleasing, um, handprints from your children or grandchildren, you can add that in as some pollinators like bumblebees will actually dig underneath those rocks um, and form their communities. You can also join in on science. You can champion showcase your gardens. If you meet specific requirements, um, they will give you sign markers like the pollinator friendly garden or the monarch way station. Um, and you can showcase it to your neighbors that you're doing something great for pollinators and for native plants alike. Um, and so the Monarch Way Station, the Pollinator Partnership have some, and there's even more for educational value. Um, you can also participate in community-based sciences with these pollinator gardens, um, the Regal Fertilary Studies, the Monarch Studies. You can tag butterflies and moss in your backyard and report on their, their populations. The City Nature Challenge is coming up here in April through Lincoln and Omaha through iNaturalist, or you can do your own science that you don't share with anybody and do nature-based journaling. So those are some of the examples there. And then benefits for you. When you spend time outside near your pollinator garden, it's going to create a relaxation. Your heart rate will slow and calm down at a resting state. Um, it's good chemicals for your brain. It's, it's putting chemicals that make you happy. Uh, it'll increase your oxygen levels. It'll help clear your mind, release the stress and vitamin D. So all doctors are saying anymore that most people aren't reaching the vitamin D levels that they need. So if you spend more time outside, you're able to get that vitamin D. So just 30 minutes a day will drastically increase your health um, in that portion. And you have a place to work or relax um, now that you've put in all of that effort. Let me get my chat up. That's all I had. I'm gonna stick around and answer questions here. Um, I will be putting a, a Google form here in the chat um, so that if you are interested in getting your pollinator seeds that we are making available for Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever today, that you'll be able to do this. And I'll be posting um, some of the other links that I wasn't able to earlier. Um, so bear with me. I'll answer questions um, as we go through here. Otherwise, thank you so much for um, tuning in this morning. I wish you the best of luck with your pollinator plots. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of our biologists across the state. And I believe next week's um, Snowy Saturday series is Corned Goose for St. Patrick's Day. Is Christy Christensen teaching that one? Uh, Julie Geyser and Jackson Ellis are doing, they're gonna do a team effort on that. And they both have two different, like different recipes and ways of going about it. So we're really excited for that program. Great. And then I think you jump, you're back with us again after that, right? Yes, I switch over to um, 
we're beginning our turkey series. Yep. So, so I will be discussing how to um, decide where you're going to be hunting or choosing where to hunt your turkeys at. We're done with these snowy Saturdays. We are, we think, we believe that if we over to spring Saturdays that it will warm up out there for us. <laughs> Thank you everyone um, and Holly will be posting that form for you to fill out. There we go. So I'm looking at the current problem right now and why the form isn't here. I'm going to put my email in here. If you just want to email me your information, that might be easier. That or they can um, put it in our, either email you or put it in, send it to us in our BOW chat mm -hmm. message to whatever's. I think I've changed the permissions now. If you still have issues, go ahead and just email me and I will get those um, kits in the mail to you or to Julia where you can pick them up. Um, and I will go back to the Facebook event on the bow page and post all the additional links there um, so that you can look through the reference items that we had available. Um, additionally, I'll have the uh, contact emails for all of the Nebraska native based nurseries here in Nebraska as well. Perfect, Patsy. Thank you for checking that. And I'm already getting some emails in from everybody. So perfect. Thank you for coming, everybody. Stay warm as well.
Holly, does it give you the option to end it? The program? I have the option to leave the meeting. You want to stop the recording to make sure you have it. Um, okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I, I won't. I'll give it. A, I mean, we're down to eight people, so it's about. I'll wait for a few more minutes just to make sure we everybody okay. captures the link. And I, I'm just going to get a Word document um, and turn it into a PDF um, to post in the discussion for the event. Yes. Um, and it'll include all of the links I talked about. Great. Thank you for joining us this morning. No problem.